Hello everyone, this is Robert Aceves and I'm here with Neil Babbins with another episode of MindFit Podcast. How you doing, Neil? Doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Um, we had a, a lot of issues this morning with the sound and a bunch of things that happened. Uh, we were supposed to be doing an interview with Jesus R., who's a, a famous film director, yeah. But um, unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. So we're going to change it a little bit and talk a little bit about how to handle upsets. So, yeah. Tell us about this, Neil. What do you well, think? We, it, well, we had some, like you said, we had some technical difficulties. I think almost everything that can go, go wrong went wrong. You know, the Internet wouldn't start. We had sound difficulties, audio settings, whatnot. And um, unfortunately, you know, we had planned to do an interview, like you said. And then uh, unfortunately, the uh, film director had to move on. He had another call. So we had to sort of uh, regulate ourselves and figure out what to do instead and, um, you know, clean up the situation, repair the situation, and then come back to uh, a place of um, of what you're going to talk about a little bit also, which is the here and now, right? Being in the present, not being in the past and not being in the future and creating most of human suffering uh, through the process of thinking about what's coming next or what happened before as opposed to being in the here and now. So the faster you can get back to the here and now, the faster you could deal with an upset because we were upset because um, his representative said, you know, he waited for 20 minutes and then had to leave. And it, you know, it, it, it felt very crushing in the moment. But, um, you know, this is our was our one of our first interviews here on MindFit. So, um, you know, we had to sort of figure it out really quickly and also deal with all those emotions that happen, you know, when there's an upset, when something that you you think is uh gonna gonna go a certain way doesn't (laughs) so (laughs) yeah yeah Um, Yeah, it's it's really i mean we were uh this is the first time like you said we're doing this uh we sincerely apologize for keeping mr azuz um on hold for over 20 minutes and what we were trying to figure out and then he just said okay i need to go do my thing but um you know we've been doing this for almost a year now and i think like uh we've never had any issues like this and so it's funny how that happens, right? The day that you are supposed to be doing something, it doesn't happen the way you were expecting it. And then you suddenly, you know, feel like you prepare for this, you did all these things, and then they don't come through the way you expected them. And I feel like this year has been like that for a lot of people, like a lot of my, oh. you know, friends and, and some of my clients, they had so many plans, plans to travel, plans to get married, plans to, you know, go places. And then suddenly this year happens and it's like, oh, we can't do any Plan- of it. Yeah, you know, plans to, go buy, plans to go buy toilet paper, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's not going to go another water. Here, right? Right? Yeah. Bottle yeah. water. No, not going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a big upset too, you know, for a little while. Yes. But yeah, absolutely. And the, th- the thing is, because this morning you tried to do something, which you did eventually do here now with a, a different sound platform that you wanted to use to get uh, better quality sound for our podcast. And I think it's important that people realize that even though you have upsets, because that was the beginning, one of the be, uh, beginnings of our difficulties this morning is, is in making all that come together, that people will say, well, I'm no longer going to take risks. I'm no longer going to take, take chances. I'm no longer going to try new things to improve upon, you know, uh, whatever I'm doing, because I don't want that to happen again. I don't want another upset. So I'm not going to travel again. I'm not going to go out and try to meet new people again. I'm not going to try a new platform again or a new software program again, because look what happened last time. And that's living in the future, you know, as opposed to living in the here and now. It's not, you know, really a big deal in the in the grand scheme of it. Of Mm -hmm. course, it was didn't come across well to Jesus uh, or the film director. But you know, we can always clean up, pick up the pieces and move on from it. So that's the whole idea of living with upsets and being in the here and now, I think, is that don't not try to do things to improve upon yourself because you're afraid of making a mistake. You're afraid of fumbling. You're afraid of looking bad. You're afraid of looking unprofessional. So much fear in, in a lot of people about taking risks like that. Like, so what? If you're disappointed, so what if you disappoint somebody else? You didn't do it with intentions to do that. You clean it up. You regulate, you bring yourself back to the here and now, you press reset and you start over. And if somebody doesn't want to come back to you based on that one particular event, um, then, you know, perhaps that was the energy that was meant to be, you know what I'm saying? But people want to prevent that and just look good and be polished. And as a result, we tend to stay, stay stag- stagnant, but stay stuck, you know, mm-hmm. or stay within a certain paradigm. And then sometimes we sit and dream and wonder how come we can't break out of that paradigm. A lot mm-hmm. of it is because we're thinking in the future. I don't want. To, I want to avoid upsets. Why? Why yeah. do you want to avoid upsets? You know, that's <laughs> where you. That's where you learn. You pick up the pieces, and you get gain confidence from that. Like, I have an upset. You know, I mean, you don't want to purposely bring them on, 
you know, uh, well, some people do. Some people actually say create upsets, create breakdowns so that you can see that you can rebuild them and that will give you more confidence to actually rebuild them. But, you know, you'll be okay, basically, is, is what the here and now says. So take risks, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Do things. I mean, not with a lack of preparation, but take risks, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm, so I'm going to read a story that, you know, there's two things I want to say, but one, I'm going to read a story that I posted recently on my, you know, uh, Instagram. Uh, I did this story in Spanish, but I'm, I'm going to translate it. Um, it doesn't translate as, you know, 100%, but I'll try to, you know, explain it a little bit more. It's called In the Now. It's very short. It says, a Japanese warrior was captured by his enemies and imprisoned that night. He could not sleep because he knew that the next day he would be interrogated tortured and ex executed then the words of his zen master came into his mind tomorrow is not real it is an illusion the only reality is now real suffering is living in ignorance of this dharma and in parenthesis as teaching uh, in the midst of this of his terror he suddenly understood the meaning of his words felt at peace and slept peacefully and that's it. That's the end of the story. So it basically, you know, this this guy, this warrior, got captured. He's going to be killed the next day, tortured and executed, uh, interrogated. And he, you know, he knows that this is going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. And yet he remembers his teachers, you know, uh, saying that that nothing is real. Everything is an illusion, and the only reality is now. So if you focus on the now and the present, you know, and you really, really uh, do that, then you won't suffer um, uh, because you're there, right? The only suffering, I guess, would be the moment when he's getting killed in this case. But if if you're not thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, then you're and you're able to be in the moment, then you'll be able to to experience that more, and and the suffering goes away. So the only time we suffer is when we ignore this. And you know, to give an example, because of this, um, I'll say it real quick. Uh, years ago, I used to date this girl, and she had a kid. And it's the first time anyone called me daddy, by the way. <laughs> it was really uh it wasn't the last though, though. <laughs> No. <laughs> and um this kid was like I would I want to say about five years old, and we were, you know, having dinner, and then suddenly the kid spilled his glass of milk. And, you know, I, I saw that the mom started getting, you know, really, you know, aroused and was about to yell at the kid. And I just stood up. I grabbed a little, you know, napkin and some uh, rag. And then I told the kid here, you just clean it. And then he, he cleaned it and he was like all weirded out. He was expecting somebody to reprimand him or say something. And, and then that was it. And then later she was like, oh my gosh, what happened? Like, how come you didn't say anything? I was like, what should I have said? And she's like, you should have yelled at him because he spilled the milk, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I've spilled milk before. It it happens, you know, and it had already happened. Like yelling is not going to fix anything. Um, mm -hmm. Cleaning it would. And so that's why I gave him a rag and, and made him clean his own mess. And mm -hmm. that was it. And then mm -hmm. she's like, oh, wow. And, you know, for her, it was a big thing. But that's that's kind of what living in the moment is. Like if somebody spilled the milk, you mm -hmm. clean it and that's it. It's happened, right? You can't change the past. Once it happens, then you just try to clean it, work from it from there and try to live in the present. And I feel like that's one way to mitigate some of that suffering and to feel better when things go wrong. You know, that's my take on that. Yeah, two things come up for me about that. A lot of people I, I talk to a lot of uh, clients about the difference between response mm -hmm. and reaction. <clears throat> Visceral response is your emotional reaction. Uh, you know, what happens to you emotionally with something, someone spills milk, you get upset, you get disappointed, you get angry, you get frustrated in the moment. So it comes up, you vent it out, or, you know, you, you process it, you be with it. And then your reaction is what you do with it. Your actions are behaviors, mm -hmm. what you're going to say, what you're going to do, what you're not going to say, what you're not going to do, uh, how you're going to detach yourself from the moment, like you're talking about and be in the here and now process it and just clean up the spilled milk. And so anything else that you need to clean up, you know, if you have technical issues, you clean it up with the person you're supposed to have on. If you spilled milk, you clean it up. You might ask, uh, is there a way to to be careful next time? Is there something to look at as to where to place the milk so it's not as easily spilled? Or did the person do it because they were upset about something? So there's, there's ways to, you know, uh, clean it up afterwards, you know, physically and emotionally. But the difference between response and reaction, response is your visceral automatic emotional response to something and mm -hmm. then your reaction is what you're going to do with it and there is a small capsule of time in between your response and reaction 
um, and you have more mastery over that uh, period of time than you think you do. A lot of clients say to me, and I frustrate them when I say this, I say, you think you have no control. I can't control my anger. That's a fallacy. That's a myth. It's not true. You have anger that comes up and there's a, there is a window of time, however small, that you have to process what's going on and what you're going to do with it, what you're making it mean, the story that you're telling yourself, you know, the choices that you have, the options that you have. It's difficult because it's overwhelming. It's a strong feeling. We always feel, mm -hmm. we always feel that we have to do something about our feelings. I'm angry, so I got to get angry. No, you don't. You could be angry. You could be upset. You could be disappointed and then choose what you're going to do. Now, if you want to go somewhere and vent, go somewhere and vent for 30 seconds. If you want to leave the room and go punch a pillow or sc scream into a pillow or punch a bag, fine, or go walk around the block, that's okay too. That's also a reaction that you could do if you're, if you're, it's available to you. But if someone spills milk and you get angry, you know, you have a moment. There is such a thing as the capsule of time between response and reaction. And I think the second thing that came up to me is that for me is that a lot of my clients will say, well, how do I do that? We're in the mm -hmm. how-to generation. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not blaming it on the millennials. I'm just saying that because everybody says that to me, well, even <laughs> when they're 40s, 50s, and 60s. But how do I do that? How-to, how-to, how-to. It's the how-to generation. And unfortunately with psychotherapy and self-growth, you could learn, you can learn skills, you can learn, um, you know, techniques, but the idea is to get to the root of the issue. So the how-to is you got to practice. How do I play soccer? It's like saying, how do I become a, a professional soccer player? Like asking me in five minutes, you know, I don't play soccer, but I'm just saying, well, you learn the basics, you know, and then you start doing it and then you fumble, you have upsets, right? You have make mistakes, you know, and then you learn what your limitations are. You learn what your strengths and weaknesses are. You build upon those and it's a process and you're going to lose a few games. Even if you get to the top, you're going to lose a few championships. You're going to lose a few um, major games and you're going to be demoted at times, you know, just like anybody in any field, you're going to have good years. You're going to have bad years and you, you, you pick up the pieces and you move on. So the how to is not such a, it's not ABC. Cause I think when you talked about that Japanese warrior, I think a lot of people listening would say, that's fascinating, but if I'm going to be tortured and killed tomorrow, how do I get those thoughts out of my mind is what they're going to ask. How to, I mean, I get what you're saying. If I stay in the here and now, it's an illusion. I'm in the here and now. Right now, I'm just looking at the floor. It's just me in the floor. But I do know that in six hours, I'm going to be tortured and killed. So how do I get that out of my head? You know, what's the process of coming back to the here and now? How do I do that? How do I get those intrusive thoughts out of my head? Because I know it's a reality tomorrow morning, unless, of course... We get invaded by, uh, you know, or something, you know, or there's a 7.5 <laughs> and <laughs> the torture chamber collapses and, you know, the wall falls and I could run. But what are the options? What are the chances of that? So I guess what I'm think I'm thinking for people listening that they might be saying, well, how would I do that? How would I come back to the here and now? And I always say, what, what I say is being aware of what you're feeling, you know, you're mm -hmm. feeling scared, you're feeling whatever you're feeling. And allow yourself to be with those feelings, let them come up in waves and go out with, go out with the, out, out like waves, you know, allow yourself to feel whatever the feelings are as they come up. Don't deny the feelings and then just let them come and go as they come and go and focus on, focus as much as you can on what's in front of you. you yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. I, that's, that's really, um, you know, when we talked about mindfulness is about being in the present and, you know, bringing your attention here in the now, um, and and this story, you know, we can we could say that uh, we are all going to die someday, and we know that. So that thought could could make some people feel anxious, you know, knowing that they're that we're all going to die at some point. And it's kind of like this, you know, except this in this story, it's tomorrow. But you know, I mean, and there will be people who will be dying tomorrow, and there will be people who are going to be dying today who might be listening to this. But the idea is to to be able to enjoy the moment, even. To up to up until that moment right before you die, and then you know once you take that last step, you take the last step, and then you move on to whatever comes after that, if there's anything, or just if that's the end, that's the end. But but the idea is to be and enjoy even to the last second of this life, and and to be you know present. Um, another thing that comes to mind with all this, when I was in school, I remember you know we we were studying memory and how it works with our brains and things like that. Um, they still don't know, you know, as far as I know, they scientists don't, don't know exactly where our memories are stored yet, but they do know that, you know, they sort of come to like when you bring a memory to mind, 
there's a part of your brain that rebuilds that memory and 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 you literally have you know connections in your brain that are being formed when you remember certain things so you know which is why you know we if we learned to ride a bike you know when we were 10 and we you know haven't ridden a bike in like what 10 20 years and we get on a bike now we know how to use it because those connections are still there somehow and we rebuild those connections again you know in a matter of seconds sometimes and we are able to get back on the bike again and then you know know how to use it you know years later so we have all this you know amazing machinery inside of us however sometimes when we have anxiety and when we're feeling neurotic or you know psychotic we are you know we're bringing this memories from the past sometimes you know they're not so great memories and they're about our failures and things that have happened to us and so we make those very uh, alive in the present and we our fears can be very real you know like thinking about you know being tortured or killed t tomorrow you know just imagining those things could be very you know disheartening and it can make us feel uh like you know like suffering like we we would suffer just thinking about that and you know trying to you know and that's how we feel like if we're going to have a presentation or we are going to you know go to court or do some kind of thing that could be very potential um you know, stress situation. And so, you know, learning to be in the moment and to really let go of that can really be helpful um, in order to to be ha healthier and happier, I think. And that's why I, th I think it's important to live in the now. Yeah, there's there's a difference between anticipatory anxiety and, you know, chronic, more generalized anxiety. You know, anticipatory anxiety is basically what you said, you're about to give a presentation, you're about to get on a plane and you don't like to fly, you know, mm -hmm. you're about to write a very important exam, you know, you're about to go out on a first date and there's a certain amount of concern or anticipation that you have about a certain event. I mean, the Japanese warrior, I mean, that's anticipation. I mean, you know, 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 chance this is what's going to happen. And he knows that it's going to be... <laughs> beyond horrific. So there's a certain anticipate and he'd be under anticipatory anxiety about a specific situation or event that's upcoming. And then there's more generalized anxiety, which doesn't really have a specific trigger. It could be triggered by things, but it's something that is very uh, pervasive and consistent. Mm -hmm. And it makes you hypervigilant and excessively worry and ruminate and overthink everything. And uh, every possible thing that can, ha can happen, even if it's not even very plausible at all, becomes accentuated and amplified. So, but that's not based on a certain event coming up that's more generalized. And that kind of anxiety is usually a distraction. What I tell people is that that's your mind trying to distract you from something else that's going on, from more core emotions and experiences that are going on. It's trying to take you away and give you something to do. It's like a video game in your head. You know, it's like sitting in your gaming chair, except you're sitting in your gaming chair in your mind. Mm -hmm. Everything matters, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and really nothing of it matters. So um, basically, um, it's 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 trying to distract you from something else that's going on, some other um, feeling that's going on or emotion that's going on. So the, the Japanese warrior wouldn't be experiencing generalized anxiety. He'd be experiencing anticipatory anxiety if he wasn't in the here and now, you know, but it's the same concept. Because someone who's ha who has going to be tortured tomorrow is would be thinking about that, would be, t be taking them away from the fear and the sadness of having to die and the disappointment of how it went down and everything else, um, be taking them away from that. But generalized anxiety would be taking you away from, say, more core emotions like feeling inadequate or, um, you know, feeling generally, generally sad about something or having memories that are coming up or being triggered or activated by, by your life, frustrations, um, shame, embarrassment you know, um, usually memories from a long time ago. So it's the same idea, but, but there's two different kinds of anxiety in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to share today, I think it's important, um, is, uh, I was talking to one of my clients yesterday and we were discussing how, you know, sometimes you live life and you do things and you get bored of them. And for example, now, you know, a lot of people are getting bored of Netflix because everything is starting to become, you know, very, very repetitive or there's just there's no new shows anymore. And so it's like, oh, now I have to rewatch some of the other shows or or just simply watching Netflix all day. It's becoming, a, you know, where you can't go to the movies or you can't go out and do other things. Um, and it's starting to become, you know, a drag. 
And we we're discussing, you know, like also getting into a job that, you know, starts to become very repetitive or you feel like you're you're not really going anywhere. And so I was telling, you know, this person that years ago I, I used to, you know, I used to be all about creativity. I used to dye my hair red and then green and, and not just talking like, really? yeah, like, you know, yeah, I, I was bright green, bright red. And this is when yeah, I was younger. Cindy Lauper thing going on, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I would, oh. I, I did piercings, you know, and, and I did the piercings not because I, I liked that, but I wanted to push myself to do things that I would normally not do. And then I tried, you know, I would travel a lot to different places and I always traveled to a place I've never been. Um, I would do things differently. I would never go to the same restaurant for a long time. You know, I was always trying to do things differently, new, you know, innovative, blah, blah, blah. Then one day I realized that I was doing everything so different all the time that that became my norm. Like, you know, it was it was an automatic like I was doing things differently all the time that for me to go to normal and have just regular red, you know, black hair, my normal hair or to dress normal like everybody else that was that was the that was different for me, you know, so I started doing it and and then I started to be more like a human being as as far as like doing, you know, a job and doing the things that people did. Um, and, you know, um, at some point I, I, I went to Japan a few times and, and during one of those trips, I remember I was sitting and one of the exercises that we would do is to just focus on your breath. Right. And then you sit and you focus on your breath over and over and over. And imagine doing that for eight days where all you're doing is focusing on your breath. Eventually it gets boring. <laughs> it's yeah. like you start to feel repetitive. Like it's you know, it's the same action over and over, which is just breathing and breathing. But then I realized that even through breathing, if you're not fully conscious doing it and you do it in automatic, it becomes boring. But if you're if you if you take each breath as if it's the first time you're breathing, as if you if you see it as a fresh thing and then eventually, you know, I got to that mindset where every breath was important and it just felt good to be in the moment. And, you know, the past didn't matter, like, you know, the seven or eight days that I had been meditating, it didn't really matter anymore. And the pain just goes away. And being in the moment was really, really uh, an amazing experience where I wasn't thinking about the future either. I was just there, you know. And it, you train your mind to do that over and over. And so when I came back, everything just seemed so, you know, interesting. And I could just sit and watch a movie or not watch a movie, do a, a puzzle or, you know, or just sit and listen to someone talk or just do nothing. And it was OK. You know, it was fine. And that's yeah. the 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 kind of the idea that I feel like living in the now really means is to be able to do whatever you're doing, but be present, even if you've done it a million times. It's still, it's still the millionth and one time. Do it as if it was the first time, and that would make you feel better. And that would be, you know, one way to live this life uh, happier and and more. You know, I call it with an awakened mind, where you're just there, you know, experiencing every moment and experiencing your life, which is really what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember also that when people do practice that, again, when you start to have any kinds of feelings that come up emotions, you know, that are uncomfortable or unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I'll plug one of my favorite psychologists, Dr. Joan Rosenberg. She mm -hmm. talks about how it's a 90 second experience when you have an uncomfortable feeling that comes up. When you're being in the here and now, when you're being aware of your breath, if you happen to feel things, it's not a question of not feeling uncomfortable feelings, being in the here and now, just being empty, like an empty chamber. If those feelings come up, allow them to come up because the more you allow them to come up and you become aware of them, the more they know they have a place in your system. And the more they know they have a place in your system, the less they'll try to have a place in your system. In other words, the less they'll insist upon it and come back with a vengeance. So the more you could be with uncomfortable feelings and just allow them to be, they're not a threat to you because they're not final, they're not fatal, they last 90 seconds at most, and then they dissipate like the ocean waves. They'll come back later, you know, they'll come back, <laughs> but you know, and they don't feel good, but they don't do anything to you. They just don't make you feel good viscerally for in, in the moment. So when you're being in the here and now, don't think that the goal is to not feel anything, to not feel anything negative or anything, uh, uh, you know, controversial or anything uncomfortable. You could feel whatever you feel, because if your feelings have a place in, in your system, they will not insist upon having a place in your system, which means we won't have to work so hard in our everyday lives to not feel uncomfortable feelings because we're not afraid to. Mm -hmm. You know, 
that's what I'm saying earlier, we were saying about upsets and being in the here and now. You won't be afraid to take risks and try new things and, you know, expand upon yourself. Because even if it doesn't, what if it doesn't go well? Well, <laughs> okay, so it doesn't go well. So what happens? I get disappointed. Oh, okay. For how long? 90 seconds, right? Mm-hmm. Unless you think about it over and over and over again. You know, you expand and you, the 90 seconds. <laughs> that's right. You know, it becomes 90 hours. You know, 90 what I'm hours. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know? Or 90 years if you <laughs> live over Usually, 100. <laughs> and then you end up come, coming to talk to me, and I love to talk to people. At the same yeah. time, you know, you say, mm-hmm. hey, but if this, everyone did this, you'd be out of business. I'm like, I don't mind being out of business if it's if, if it's that reason, you know, mm-hmm. if everybody would realize that. <laughs> Yeah. So I think that that's important for people to know also, because people think like when they say how to, they want to get rid of something. Mm-hmm. They want to get rid of feeling badly, which is, you know, but, but those emotions are important to be able to, to experience. So yeah, yeah. I just want to reiterate. Yeah. The, yeah. Really the, you know, the, one of my favorite sayings in Zen is that you have to take the bull by the horns. And so you take that feeling and you face it and you hold it by the horns and you experience it, right? And if you hold it by the horns, the it's hard, a lot harder for the bull to actually kill you because you're you're facing it you know, straight up. But if you're trying to run away from it, the bull is going to follow you and it's going to stab you and you don't want that. So it's easier to just you know be present to try to you know face things um, and 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 experience them. And you know, really, uh, if you if you, I, I feel like pain is, you know, a lot of times um, expanded, like you said, and, and sometimes it could last 90 seconds. But then we, you know, like I remember um, years ago when I when I was younger, my me and my brother used to p- play with fireworks, you know, when we were like nine. Um, and, oh, wow. you know, my parents didn't know this, but we would, you know, buy them in, in, in Mexico. If you're young, you could do that. And one time we were playing fireworks and one of them exploded on my arm. And when it exploded, you know, there was a lot of smoke around and you couldn't see anything. But then when the smoke went away, I looked in my arm and there was a piece of skin hanging, you know, because it was burnt and it didn't hurt. But I saw it and just the look of the skin hanging from my arm, it started to make me cry. And the, the, the look of that made me cry more. And just to see that my arm was kind of destroyed in some way, um, yeah. you know, it hurt me more than the actual pain the pain was not there was no pain there because i was i guess the adrenaline in your body just helps you with that pain but the 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 thought of it and all the stuff that came after that and you know uh, i remember going to the doctor and my dad took me and and my dad was you know looking at me and and the doctor was trying to do things with my arm and and you know i was I, i it didn't hurt but i but because my dad was watching i wanted to cry to make him feel sorry for me in some way you know and so those kinds of things you know it's it's like we create that suffering i was creating that suffering more in my head because i'd never experienced this it was the first time i also felt bad because you know we were uh being um naughty i guess because we were not allowed to play with fireworks and we we still did it so you know and those things are just things that 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 we create and so sometimes like you said we have an upset and then the pain was is 90 minutes and uh, no, 90 seconds. I'm sorry. And then you, you continue to bring it up and you keep thinking about it and you keep, you know, r- ruminating on it. And that causes you more suffering than, you know, just letting it go and going back to the present. Yeah. A lot of people gain a lot from creating the suffering around them because a similar thing happened to me on my bike when I was about eight, I fell off and I scraped my right knee and it didn't really hurt that much. But when I got up, there was a big patch of blood underneath mm. my knee and all my friends around me were the ones making a big deal about it. Like, oh, wow. Look what happened. You know, I looked down and I was like, I saw the blood. And when I see blood, I don't like blood on me. You right. know? Um, anybody really, but, um, so I, I started to cry and I, my friends were carrying me home, like rock, walking my bike for me and carrying me home each on one arm. Like what is, you know, like in retrospect, what, you know, you think I would just been in a major car accident or something like that, or I just like wiped out on a, on a motorcycle or something. I just scraped my knee, you know, it was (laughs) no big deal, but I was playing into the energy of my friends, making a really big deal about what they had just seen. I mean, just fell off the bike. It wasn't a big thing. And on the side, it could have been worse, you know, like Mm -hmm. my mother always said, could have hit your head, you know, (laughs) thanks to mom, you know, (laughs) she always always thought of the best outcomes, you know, but, um, (laughs) You know, I, it was no big deal, but I fed off their energy and I created the suffering and I also got attention. I got validation. I got love. Mm -hmm. I got support. So sometimes we do that for that reason also, because it gives us something, Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. Yeah. 
this is something that we're craving rather than mm -hmm. communicating it and asking for it in more effective ways, you know? So that's something else to consider that made me think of that when you were telling your story, because you looked at your dad, like you wanted him to feel sorry for you, you know? <laughs> yeah. And this and that. And yeah, of course we want love. We want comfort. And, you know, I, I was a little scary. A firework blew up. You know? <laughs> it was, um, but you know, the, the the other thing I, I I'll share this too. Um, years ago, I had some problems with um, somebody in my family. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but he uh, she you know I was telling her about living in the present, just letting go, and she's like, "Oh, but you expect me to just let go of everything like like just like that? You know, it doesn't work that way." And I was like, "Yeah, well, I mean, what are you trying to do? Just hold on to it and keep you know suffering from it, you know, and and keep bringing it up." Versus like, let's just let it go and move on and try to be in the moment and, and continue to experience our life and maybe agree to disagree or something. But, you know, just to really you know, move things along. But the, some people, you know, they, they want to hold on to things and they want to hold on to negative feelings. They want to hold on to, oh, you did this to me and they don't want to forgive or forget. And I feel like that's where the suffering comes from. It's not the actual thing that thing could have been, you know, five seconds or 30, 90 seconds that it lasted. But then we want to keep bringing that up. Oh, you did this to me. Oh, no, you cheated on me. Oh, no, you, you know, uh, shouldn't have said that. And you said it. And now, you know, I'm, I'm hurt. Well, yeah, it happened. Maybe when they said it, it was like two seconds. But then you you keep bringing it up and you keep thinking about it. And that is what's causing you more suffering than the actual thing. And so realizing this is important. And in, in the, the like going back to the story, real suffering is living in ignorance of this teaching. You know, if you ignore this and you and you just continue to you know live in the past, you will continue to suffer. And until you decide that, OK, that's it. I'm, it's, I'm ready to let it go. And I've seen people do that, you know, and we talked about it on the Unwell documentary when the girl, you know, decided that her her husband and her daughter had killed him. So he killed her, his daughter and then killed himself. And she was holding on to that. And then one day, you know, when she was doing ayahuasca, this lady decided mm. to, that, you know, she was going to let it go because she said, I, I have already lost these two people. What else am I going to lose? And so she decided to let go of, of that thought and let go of their, her loved ones. And that doesn't mean she still doesn't love them. Of course she loves them. Um, but now she can let go of that pain and the suffering and just be in the moment and continue to move on with her life and experience the present and maybe start a new relationship or something, you know? Right. I think it's important to, to note that there's a difference between holding a grudge mm -hmm. and creating boundaries. Right. Holding a grudge, anyone who has a grudge or is holding on to something, really what that is, is unresolved grief. Mm -hmm. If you have cynicism, grudges, hostility towards a person, you keep bringing back the same thing. or you, It's really unresolved grief that you have. You've been unable to detach yourself from what was what was and what was not and sit with the experience of the grief. You're still holding on to the grief. And you're not resolving the grief. So it keeps coming back in terms of a form of a grudge. But that's different than creating a boundary. You could say to somebody, I'm letting go. I'm resolving my grief. I'm healing myself. I'm soothing. But that doesn't mean that it's open season, right? Because that was a toxic relationship, a toxic environment. I'm not going back to it. I'm not falling back into it. You know, I'm not creating a story around it either. I'm just not doing it. So when something shows up differently, I'll show up differently. If this relationship is still toxic, I'm just drawing a boundary and that's and that's the end of it. That's not a grudge. You know, some people say, oh, forgive and forget. So just open up and join hands and sing Kumbaya and everything's fine. That doesn't quite work that way. And that's okay that it doesn't work that way. And I think it's important to recognize the difference between holding a grudge and creating a boundary. Doesn't mean you have a grudge because you have a new boundary. I'm not going back to that situation. I'm not going back into that relationship. I'm not going back into that environment. I'm not playing that game anymore. That doesn't mean I have a grudge. It means that I'm not allowing that to bombard my system. Even though I can deal with it if it happens, doesn't mean I'm going to allow it to happen. Right. So that's self autonomy. So I think that's important also for people to get. Because a lot of times when we talk about the, um, you know, the Zen here and now, that could be what I think from my experience, confuses some people with it because they really think that it's about obliterating all negative feelings, obliterating all negative thought, you know, like allowing anything and anyone into your life, you know, but at the same time, you know, you can create healthy boundaries around what's toxic. And, and that really is impactful on people because they're saying they, they realize that they can no longer interact with you the same way. So that serves as a lesson to them 
that they have some healing to do, that they have some Zen to do, to go into their here and now and say, what do I have to heal? So I'm not toxic. The only way you can become toxic to somebody else is if you're also grieving. That's the only thing that's making you toxic to somebody else or or allowing yourself to be in a toxic relationship is that you are still grieving something also. So if you remove yourself from that toxic relationship, it forces somebody else to be impacted by that change. They may not change the way you want them to, but it it forces impacts a certain change or at least gives them the opportunity to take a look at what they need to heal themselves. Yeah. So I I mean, I feel like in some ways, and I've, I've experienced this with people, um, you know, some people who are having a toxic relationship, for example, they may be having a toxic relationship at some point, but then through practicing Zen and healing and, you know, meditating and living in the now, eventually, you know, both parties, if they, if they do it right, you know, I, I feel like, and you get to that, you know, Zen place uh, of being in the moment and not, you know, bringing the past into the present. Uh, it is possible for those people to have, you know, a relationship that's not toxic again, you know, and, and, and I've seen it. The The idea, though, is to change, you know, really. And and I agree with, you know, not going back to the things that hurt you. But at the same time, you know, the thing that comes to mind is um, there's a, a I want to say it's like a series, a mini series with uh, Julia Roberts. Do you remember the one where she is a counselor at this facility where they're uh, helping soldiers that have PTSD? Oh, I don't think I ever saw it, but I think I know which one you mean. I yeah, I think it's watched. called Homecoming. I'm not so sure. But anyway, it's Julia Roberts, and she's a counselor, and they bring this people, the soldiers who have PTSD, and they're trying to help them. And, you know, it turns out that, spoiler alert, uh, that mm-hmm. they're they have this drug that they're testing where they're trying to make the soldiers forget their PTSD and all the things that happened to them during the war. Now the reason being is because at the end of their treatment they're ready to go back to war. And so it's a, it's a way that the government can reuse the soldiers, you know, versus before with PTSD wow. they become useless basically for them. So now they have this, you know, uh, they forgot what happened to them and now they're able to to live their life again and the idea is you know and, and in some ways you know it makes you wonder because in some ways yes the soldiers are you know better they're healed but they 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 love going to war you know and now they can do that again and then they're going to go to war and they're going to get PTSD again and guess what they're going to drug them again and so that's the it's a little controversial in that sense but on the other hand, it made me wonder, like, what if we could do that with people, you know, because in some ways I felt like that with uh, meditation, like I felt in some ways you, when you let go of your past and your you know, negative failures and, or, you know, things that happen to you in relationships, then suddenly you're able to to go back out there and get into a relationship again and you might get hurt again. You know, they might do things to you that are not pleasant. But, you know, if you already let go of the, of the past one, then it's OK. The problem comes in when you're holding on to grudges and things that happen to you f- to, with other people. And then you bring them into your new relationship and you and you don't have that trust anymore because you've already been hurt. And that doesn't mean the person in front of you hurt you, but the you know other people have so that you you take that on and put it onto this new relationship. And that causes you to have, you know, sabotage yeah. yourself in some way. So that's yeah. that's the idea is to just really be able to let go of the past completely where, you know, you kind of in some way become innocent again, you know, and, and like when we were 15, you know, we didn't know what was coming. And then we started dating and then things happen. Right. As long as let, letting go doesn't mean trying to pretend it's not there. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. If, if it's gone, you know, it really feels like it's gone. Like it doesn't affect you anymore. Now, you you know, the cool thing about meditation and Zen is that you can still remember it. You know, it's not like you forgot, like in the movie where they completely erase their memories. You know, this one, you can still remember them, but they don't affect you anymore and you don't react to them anymore. You know, you can see and remember the things you did, but it doesn't have, uh, you, you're not grasping onto it anymore. And scary That's yeah. about war, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It more effective things to do that with, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, yeah. Good. So be in the here and now. That's the <laughs> bottom line. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, we got to go now, but thank you. Any last words before we end today? Um, I, you know, I just say, um, listen to this podcast a couple of times. Cause I think we've, we've said a lot of things that are very helpful and, um, you know, really talk about the here and the here and now, and, uh, to remember that 
to, to remember all aspects of it from like difference between grudges and boundaries and response reaction. And like you said about the Japanese warrior, take all the information that we've given and weave it together. You know, don't just take one aspect of it because then you might end up burning out on it. Because if you don't look at it comprehensively, you know what I'm saying? Every technique that anyone gives you will burn out if you don't look at it comprehensively. So I just wanted to okay. end with that. Sounds good. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everyone for watching us or listening to us. Uh, this podcast is every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Thank you to all the people who've been watching and or listening to us from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the people who've donated, thank you as well. Uh, if you have any questions, com comments, or concerns, or you want to tell us what you think about today and you know, what are your thoughts about what we talked about, do you believe you know it is possible to live in the now and to let go of the past? Or do you feel like you know there are certain things you can't or should not be let go of? That's okay. We love to hear from you. Uh, so please put your comments below or send them to us. Uh, we're on Instagram at MindFit Podcast, or you can also look us up on YouTube. Just look up MindFit Podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Bye, Neil. And we'll see you next Bye. week on Tuesday at 6 p.m. All right. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by MindFit. Please help us to share this podcast with your friends and family to grow this community. And if you'd like to donate to this podcast or if you'd like to share your comments, questions, or concerns, send them to mindfitpodcast at gmail.com or you can call us directly at 714 328 4661.